As I said, I have to thank Mike Mikulay for uh, inviting me to make this presentation. I first received this email. I must admit I was very surprised because I thought the interest in tritium had completely vanished. And so I thank Mike for giving me an opportunity. Before I forget, I, is that okay? Before I forget, I did want to ask uh, Ed a question. I, I think Ed gave the impression or he even had a statement that palladium does not produce neutrons. Am I right? This is the well, slide you had. No, there are occasions when neutrons are seen because fractal fusion can occur in palladium as well, also, but it's not no, as active as titanium. Slides you had it doesn't. So, so long as we agree that neutrons have been seen in palladium systems also. Yes. I have no further questions. As a result of fractal As for the mechanism, whether it's fractal fusion or not, I think we'll come at the end of, end of my talk. I, I, I think I don't fully agree with you on that particular issue. But we will start the talk and I think at the end of the talk we have. Okay, so this is the title. The scope of the bar study. Uh, we have uh, the target materials we, we study. But, well, maybe I should say one word regarding BAC. The Baba Atomic Research Center is the largest nuclear research center in India. It employs over 15,000 people. It's almost even bigger than Los Alamos in terms of number of people. The total number of scientists is about 3,500. And they work on almost every topic of science that you can think of, in chemistry, in lasers, in materials. So it was a great place to work. And uh, one of the interesting things we were able to do good research is simply was calling up a friend. You know, you can get many things done. There's a lot of cooperation. So I, I think I should explain the background in which we were able to do some good work. The, coming back to the slide, the scope of materials that we used, the various materials, the target materials are palladium, titanium, nickel. The hydrogen isotopes used were deuterium, hydrogen, of course. The loading techniques, electrolysis, gas, plasma loading, and we even had some experiments with ion beam loading. The objective of the program was, of course, to establish the nuclear origin of the phenomenon, primarily through measurement of neutron and tritium. We did not concentrate on excess heat at that point in time. The beginning. On the 24th of March, 1989, we saw a, a four-line news item in the Indian Times of India newspaper regarding the Fleischmann Bonds press conference. And the news item specifically said that uh, Fleischmann Bonds had measured neutrons. And so we got very interested. And <coughs> since at that point in time, we were all, most of us were involved in fission reactor experiments. And uh, we were excited to learn that a little test tube could produce neutrons in a simple electrolysis experiment. As the head of the neutron physics division at that point in time, I could therefore quickly mobilize neutron detectors. And by a remarkable coincidence, we happened to have the world's biggest cold fusion cell all set to go right onto the table. Now, I'll explain to you how it happened. There's a company in Ireland called the Milton Roy Company, which commercially produces palladium D2O electrolytic cells. They called it a pure hydrogen generator. And they, since it uses palladium silver alloy as the cathodes, it was uh, marketed for producing pure hydrogen separated from the oxygen. We had purchased one of these, and we were in the process of converting this hydrogen generator to a deuterium gas generator <coughs> for our so-called hot fusion plasma fusion experiment. So on 24th of March, when this announcement was made, just have, coincidentally we were in the very process of converting from NaOH to uh, Na, uh, 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 sodium deuteroxide. As I said, it uses palladium silver alloy tubes. I think Jack Rockwell made a remark yesterday. It just so happened this company particularly used the best palladium silver alloy, which gives the best results for diffusing deuterium uh, hydrogen through that. This cell had a total surface cathode area of 300 centimeters squared. 
and inner and outer pipes served as the anode, and in the annular space there were the 16 tubes, the cathode tubes are distributed in the annular space, and the maximum current capacity was 100 amps. That makes it the world's biggest contribution cell at that point in time. <laughs> and I don't think anybody has operated one bigger than that. <laughs> this is a picture of the Milton Roy cell. You can see the palladium alloy tubes, tubular there, the 16 tubes, and the gas goes through the walls of the palladium tube and comes out in the bottom. That is the pure hydrogen. And as I said, we, the original manufacturer had uh, recommended we use NaOH, and all we did was to replace NaOH with NaOD. The neutron detectors used, we uh, brought in uh, NE102A, proton recoil type plastic scintillator detector, sensitive mainly to neutrons, fast neutrons and gamma rays. We also had two types, a BF3 type slow neutron counter, 45, half a meter high, embedded in a moderator block, actually three such counters in one block, and another uh, counter consisting of helium-3 uh, slow neutron detectors embedded in a paraffin block, three, uh, a bank of three counters each. And the latter two, in the latter two, fast neutrons slow down in the moderator block before being detected by the BF3 or helium-3 detectors. And this results in what is called a statistical time spread, which is what we exploited to make some interesting observations on the nature of the neutron distribution. But I will not talk about it in this talk today. The first neutron signal we obtained with the, with the Milton Roy cell, it took us a few days to move in the neutron detectors around it and slowly ramp up. It was on 21st of April 1989. You can see, note again, that this is a semi-log scale. And so these bursts are truly gigantic. Both the proton recoil counter and the BFT counter bank showed these remarkable coincidental neutron bursts. But a meter away from the metal oil cell was a, the helium-3 bank that was serving as the background counter. And incidentally, at that, the burst, the last burst, when the cell shut down. That large burst was large enough to show a little signal in the, one, the, in the counter one meter away, the background counter. Tritium measurements, of course, uh, 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 Dr. Storms has already mentioned all about uh, tritium. We, we know that it is, uh, cannot detect it in situ. So the tritium in, in the electrolytic solution at the end of a run is typically measured through the scintillator counter. And uh, this, this is a standard <laughs> technique. Our health physics division had got imported due to uh, tritium detection equipment. They had the expertise. They've been doing it on a round-the-clock basis for various applications in back. All these issues of chemiluminescent quenching efforts that we even had uh, vials kept in dark room for several hours to allow for chemiluminescent foam and cooling. We had K42 depleted vials to avoid the background count. So the, as far as the measurement is concerned, I can assure you it is just world class. Pre-electrolysis control samples as well as standards are counted in between the post-run samples to make sure there is no drifting in the counting equipment. Results from the Milton Roy cell number, run number one, as I said, on 21st of April, we had the first huge step over a period of four hours. We were increasing the current from a low value of about a few amps towards 50, 60, 80 amps very slowly. And suddenly, the Current went up and there was a huge burst of neutrons and the cell shut itself down. There was a built-in temperature control to shut down the system if the temperature goes beyond. So that is how the, the, the system shut itself down. At that point, we took out samples and they sent it to the appropriate uh, experts. And we found a massive amount of 1.5 microcurie, which is 55.5 kilobecquerels which is 20,000 times the initial heavy water content. There is absolutely no question of any contamination. The total number of tritium atoms were 8 and 10 to the 15. The total integrated neutron E. We could get the efficiency of the detector by keeping a californium 252 source in the position and from both the, the, the BF3 counter and the proton recoil counter we had, we could estimate. And we were surprised to find <coughs> that the neutron to tritium ratio was 5 into 10. We were at that point in time thinking, as uh, Ed mentioned, it is uh, fusion, neutrons and tritium should be the same. So this was the first hit of the so-called branching ratio anomaly. 
and we were really puzzled. But within a matter of weeks, we got news that Tom Plater had also found the branching ratio anomaly, John Bockris had found it, and just now today I learned that even Romodanov had found, but that was much later, that the neutron, the branching ratio anomaly has been found by many, many people. Well, the footnote says that actually the tritium estimate is conservative as the tritium carried away with the gas stream was being disregarded. This is the summary of the Bach results. I, so far I mentioned only the, the Milton Roy cell which was in our division. But I, I, I should mention, on the 24th of March, when this news item appeared in the Times of India, the director of the center at that point in time, Dr. P. K. Ahenga, he was also equally excited. And in fact, he called me immediately, hey, Srinivasan, did you see this new site? And he immediately convened a meeting. So on the 10, 10 a.m. on the 24th of March, a meeting was convened by the director with representatives from many divisions. He said, we have to try and replicate it. This is fantastic. I mean, this is new science. So number of groups embarked with whatever materials, you know, these are the various divisions, desalination division, neutron physics division, heavy water division, analytical chemistry, the reactor operations and maintenance group who run the reactor, the silos reactor, applied chemistry division and so on. Whatever palladium they have and in various geometries, disks, hollow cylinder, cube, whatever. And with different disks, they set up cells and within a matter of time, all of them had detected neutrons, all of them had tells eight different, actually the original table from ICC of one publication has 11 tables and all of them found the branching ratio anomaly that was published in ICC of one. There were an additional series of 11 cells where the neutrons were not measured. They did not have access to neutron detectors, but they did measure the initial concentration of the tritium, final concentration and the increase. All these 11 cells also found tritium. I don't want to go into so many becquerels. And this is from ICCF1 to CD. Now, the question of the neutrons and tritium. Several independent cells <coughs> indicated that neutrons and tritium are probably generated concomitantly, more or less at the same time. But we don't know which comes first. And you can see here in one of the cells, we continued measuring the, the tritium levels. It came down, suddenly there was a huge burst of neutrons, and the next uh, tritium measurement showed an increase. Now, it could be possible that a huge burst of tritium probably gave rise to neutrons as a secondary reaction. That is a possibility. But if that is the case, one would expect, I think, 14 million neutrons. And to the best of my knowledge, whoever tried to measure the neutron energy, including Gotzi and others in, in Italy, they did not find 14 million. They only found 2.5 million. So in that sense, there is no evidence to show that the neutrons produced in a heavy water palladium cell, or for that matter, this thing, is from a secondary reaction. So this question, we'll have to keep it open. We'll proceed. Now here is another cell from the reactor operations maintenance cell. You can see the tritium point, they're taking samples. Suddenly, this is the neutron signal, both from foreground and the, uh, the background. The, the, the signal, BF3, a huge burst of neutrons. And the next sample of heavy water uh, tritium went up. and. This triangular point is what the, the, the chemists have calculated. Had there been only this much of tritium and no further addition, it should have come down like this, showing that in the next several days also, tritium continued to enter the heavy water electrolyte. But whether it was as a result of diffusion from the palladium or fresh tritium was produced is a different issue. Whatever, here again is an indication that neutrons and tritium come together. I now go to the next part of the talk. Deuterium gas plasma loaded titanium targets. We got interested in the titanium, the deuterium gas loaded titanium from the reports we obtained from the Frascati group, uh, Scaramucci and Danino, uh, others, had said that if you have deuterated titanium chips and you subject it to thermal cycling, we observe neutrons. To the best of my knowledge, they did not mention about treating. But like I said, I think Dr. Mark Prelas uh, in this institute was also excited by the same work. They have also set up, they look for neutrons. I think they published, they, they did observe neutrons. So we repeated these experiments and we used autoradiography as a very powerful tool in many of our studies. Autoradiography is a very simple technique of detecting radiation emitting zones 
It is free from electromagnetic interference. It is almost like the CR39. It, uh, you use standard medical X-ray films, 10 micron grain. At times, uh, a stock of several films is used, a stack of several films, one behind the other. High sensitivity, if it's integrated over a long exposure time, typically over 9 to 60 hours exposure, gives uh, resolved images. Developing time is only a few minutes. We even got excellent results in Polaroid film. Directly, it gives a positive. In some cases, the films were placed on both sides of the sample. Now, here is one of the first autoradiographs. I think this is the first. Within a few days of receiving information about the first day experiment, I happened to have in my drawer a conical uh, cathode and, uh, and the cylindrical disc, like a, uh, uh, a diamond. And we had used these for uh, discharge experiments or whatever. So I wanted to find out if there is any evidence of tritium. So when we placed it, we got a beautiful uh, image indicating some radioactivity or some this. <laughs> this is this dime sized uh, cylindrical um, flat piece of de deuterated titanium disc showing a number of stress, spots, but not all along the rim that has been machined, that you have probably created a lot of defect sites. Invariably, you do get uh, tritium lodged in that. It just, we don't know where it came from, when it came, but these are all in initial indications. Now, an interesting point is that the 18 keV tritium beta are able to excite the uh, uh, K-alpha, K-beta X-rays of titanium, which is 4.5 keV, 4.9 keV peaks. Therefore, when you take an autoradiograph, Partly, directly, the, the, the beta from tritium, usually we had a very thin film of mylar or something separating this from the film, so that there is no other chemical or scratching. Autoradiography demonstrates the existence of highly localized hotspots on the target surface whenever tritium, where the tritium is concentrated. So right from the beginning, we started noting these spots in several occasions. Occurrence of spots all along the periphery of the disk points to the important role of lattice defect sites which are created during the machining process. We will come to that again. I now come to the next study. I think uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Rob uh, mentioned this on the first day. It's a very interesting piece, a continuation of the uh, titanium shavings experiment. By that time, since we had already learned about the branching ratio anomaly, we knew that neutron production is too small. We didn't really concentrate on neutron measurements from this, this next round of experiments. Here we had, I, I'm going to give you a little bit more details of the experiment. We used titanium metal shavings made using a lathe, <coughs> 3 to 8 milligrams each, thoroughly cleaned in acid, water and so on, evacuated, heated 850 degrees, cooled in deuterium gas, amount of gas absorbed was measured through a pressure drop using uh, uh, well, I think it's an uh, acid manometer, uh, oil manometer. The, type, the TIDS chips were then dropped into a, lip, a cylinder containing liquid nitrogen. After loading deuterium, these crude looking chips taken directly from the machine shops after cleaning and loading, and the cylinder was periodically refilled with liquid nitrogen whenever it evaporated. And later, we looked for the presence of tritium in these chips. We had about a thousand chips. In, in, in that particular lot, it was divided into three. We had chips which were not loaded with deuterium. We had chips which were loaded with deuterium but were not subjected to the liquid nitrogen treatment. And finally, the test chips which had been dropped into the liquid nitrogen. All of them were analyzed very carefully in front of a sodium iodide detector and other beta detector. Eventually, by separating in lots, counting lots of 50, then dividing into two, and two, we were able to isolate initial deuterium gas which was as low as 10 to the min mi minus 13. Now here is an autoradiograph of one of the best chips, I should say. Remarkable, you know, you can keep looking at it to, to look at the various features. Look at the spots of, uh, and this particular chip, we could keep it in front of any beta detector and measure the beta from directly. It was actually saturating the beta detector. Of course, it was giving the 4.5 keV titanium, but look at the background nature. That means the, 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 the signal, the, the radiation going from the bottom is actually throwing its own shadow. It's a fascinating picture. A uh, large amount of tritium just uh, chip caught from the machine shop, loaded with uh, deuterium and dropped into liquid nitrogen. Next series of experiments, the plasma focus experiment. 
Now, for those who are not familiar with the plasma focus, this was actually an ongoing hot fusion program which was going on when cold fusion came. So we had uh, uh, one of my uh, young colleagues was doing a PhD thesis on that. In a plasma focus, you have a chamber and you have an anode. And, uh, this was if you can use copper, any 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 metal, even stainless steel. This could be nickel or stainless steel. But the the the, uh, the cathode and the central anode are separated by a glass sleeve, an insulator, glass insulator jacket. Now you evacuate it and fill it to a uh, 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 small uh, uh, pressure, forget the exact amount, but well under one atmosphere, and try to apply, uh, charge a capacitor band, discharge it to the spark gap, and at that time a surface discharge occurs from the central anode to the cathode, and this discharge, due to J cross B forces, sometimes they use the word rail gun, it propels the sheet, plasma sheet, along the length which eventually turns around, collapses around itself, and forms a plasma focus. The plasma focus was interestingly invented or discovered at more or less simultaneously in Los Alamos and in Kurchak. Now, it was studied for many, many years. There must be at least we have several hundred PhD theses on the study of the plasma focus. It gives repeatable neutron bursts, and the nature of the neutron producing mechanism is of interest. It is not uh, direct hot fusion uh, due to various uh, uh, what do you call it plasma instabilities, high energy ions are accelerated which, which bombards on the, on the gas. The mechanism is very fascinating, you know. But whatever it is, this is as far as we are concerned. We when cold fusion came up, we said we are producing a hot plasma of deuterium. Why not we see what happens in the interface? So that was the purpose. We stuck a titanium rod and normally they were using copper. So this was a plasma focus and we were surprised one of the, this is the actual setup you evacuate in infinite and have 50 shots. Uh, the, uh, this is a photograph of the titanium, central titanium anode after 50 shots. But this is the autoradiograph of that very same central and again when we did the estimate of the tritium, it was an amazing 10 to the 15 or whatever atom, large amount of tritium. Now, we could go back and calculate <coughs> the total number of neutrons actually produced. It was in the region of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the, new, the 6 neutrons per burst. So if you integrate it, you cannot uh, account for this tritium from the conventional hot fusion. You can now. now, the interesting thing is this is the same anode on a polaroid film with, uh, with the image resolution and so on. This is a positive, the other is negative. You can see where the tritium is lodged in all those cracks and drains. I think uh, um, uh, Ed would be interested in knowing. It's obviously some kind of mechanical <coughs> effect regions. The remarkable prop, uh, point about this particular uh, material, titanium, <coughs> is the this anode was repeatedly autoradiographed several times for the next five years. The image changed very little indicating the amazing stability of tritium in a titanium lattice. I think there is some lesson in that for us and I would say tritium therefore by implication probably hydrogen and deuterium also. Now look at the same image, 1990, next day, two days later, one week later, 1991, 1995, same rod, tritium doesn't go away. Okay, I come to the next topic, aged titanium deuteride targets. At that point in time, we have been playing around with titanium and deuteride and tritium production. In our laboratory, we had a large number of titanium deuteride discs on a copper backing. Eight of them were imported from Amersham Labs, remaining were fabricated in Way back, many years earlier, maybe 15, 20 years earlier, during the period 1972 to 1981, these were obtained for dosimetry studies using accelerated generated DD neutrons by the Health Physics Division. This is the titanium film thickness, 3 milligrams, and the D to titanium ratio. The thin film was fully loaded with deuterium, and this is, they have given the figures, the Amersham, they supply a certificate of, about the amount of deuterium there, and given the average value, the actual value is given as 0.345 for this target, 1.35 for another target, but somewhere around 1. 
he speculated that post fusion reactions might have occurred and tritium generated over a 9 to 18 year period. Just, just speculation. And therefore we performed an auto radiographic measurement and to our surprise, every one of the 12 aged targets gave a very deep 40. And later we found the images are uniform, not spotty, as in the case of mechanically uh, uh, shall we say machine mechanics. Mostly in the tens of mega, mega vehicle region, but the highest was 200 mega vehicles. Presence of tritium was confirmed by five different techniques, and the T to D ratio in that was 10 to the minus 4, which is much higher than that of the tritium in a candle reactor. So we wrote to Amashan, is there a possibility that you supplied us the, the, the heavy water you used in producing the TID targets was contaminated? Back came the reply, those days it was telex, we didn't have missing. They said it's absolute nonsense. Our procedure is so and so, we take perfect this thing and this is it, this is the certificate. There is no question of any tritium contamination. Then we wrote back to them and said, this means you have pro thrown cold fusion. And <laughs> obviously they didn't like that. Left it at that, but we still have that message. But the interesting thing, so here is the message, if, if this university has TID targets lying around, please take down and look for tritium. I'm pretty sure you find tritium there. Over the years it has just been produced. This is the the beta spectrum. Look at the counts, large amount of counts in one of the strongest CDS 996 that was the Okay, this summary of the part work which what much of what I have described was done in the first one year and it was published in Fusion Technology. So we had three papers in ICCF1, but all of them were combined to publish in Fusion Technology. I have to thank George Miley for this. We had uh, several correspondents with a huge paper with 50 authors. And it was very kind of him to offer to publish the whole thing in, in I think, the August 1990 issue of uh, Fusion Technology. Thank you, George. Part two of my talk, this was done after the... Am I okay on time? Okay, I'll continue till it's kind of... Okay, I'll quickly continue. Tritium in nickel hydrogen system, this was done during the period 1992 to 1996. We have observed tritium, both in nickel, cathode, light water, system, electrolytic cells, as well as gas, hydrogen gas loaded, self-heated nickel wire, which are published in 1965. Our interest in the, in the nickel light water system was triggered by the paper by Randy Mills in fusion technology, a lot of you know about it, where he claimed he was observing excess heat in a nickel hydrogen electrolytic cell, although he said that it is not due to fusion. Very shortly thereafter, it was reproduced, replicated by Noninsky, and we said, well, if you can produce heat with nickel hydrogen, nothing like that. That's how we got into this. I took the trouble of visiting uh, Randy Mills in his uh, laboratory, had long discussions, and I even remember telling him, listen, I don't agree with your theory, but I fully agree with your excess heat. We published four papers during that period, three, as you say, three, four, and five, and even as uh, uh, Mike mentioned, uh, my studies and on, uh, on the excess heat. Now, all of it in the electrolytic cells, they were open cells, all of them gave excess heat, not I shouldn't say all of them, quite a bit. We published it at the Nagoya meeting, a lot of people had doubts, and so when I had the opportunity to come and work for six months at SRI, Mike gave me the opportunity to, to replicate the measurements, and this time we had better equipment, we, I, I could put the cell on a digital balance and keep a track of the weight of the cell, and the open cell, the gases come out, were recombined, and the amount of uh, uh, water produced was simultaneously measured. And whatever it, through these studies, I was convinced that the so-called excess heat that we measured and reported at Nagoya was due to recombination. Because up until that point, many people, I, mean, I was not an expert in electrolysis, I learned that I shouldn't dabble in electrolysis without knowing too much about it. <laughs> but uh, people said, well, Recombination, if at all, is only a uh, few percent. So we reported as 70, 80 percent. The kind of cathodes we use, I think I'm going to mention it. Let's see, we had ran, ran in nickel. We had nickel produced in an electroform process, like uh, a German friend was mentioned. All kinds of techniques. All of them gave apparent excess heat. But 
One interesting thing is, after we found that XLC was due to recombination, I came back to Bombay and we set up fresh cells. Forget about excess heat, at least for the tritium. Unfortunately, the few cells which I operated SRI, we did not find tritium. So I was really going well Okay, I agree excess heat was false, but did the tritium also false? So we set up fresh cells, I'll come to that here. These tritium in light water cells, in, in nickel light water cells, in three different labs of Bart, January, I thanked Jed Rothwell at that point in time. After seeing uh, uh, Randy Mills' paper and Noninsky's paper, he came up with a, a protocol which he circulated a lot of us. It was very really useful. So, we had open cells with nickel cathode, etc. I'll skip all that typical line. Okay, here is a set of results. This is the so called XSC, but forget that last column. Oh, the last column gives the tritium. This was reported in Nagoya. And we had seven out of 18 cells, the first set of cells, indicated tritium. As I said, just forget about the excess heat, the open cells, the so-called excess heat. But the good point is, obviously, our calorimetric technique was perfectly valid because once you account for the excess heat, it fits in very well. So our calorimetry was good. It is just that we thought that this was anomalous excess heat. We compared it with V minus 1.52 uh, uh, into I instead of uh, V into I. If, it, if we had compared it with V into I, we would have found a negative uh, run, a negative excess heat. Okay, now these are additional cells, also published in the Nagoya uh, <coughs> meeting. In these, 7 out of 11 gave tritium. You can see the tritium level, the background level, and so on, everything is given. So, note the last two cells, which is what we call OM for online monitoring. I'll come to that in a minute. New dedicated liquid scintillation spectrometer. So people accuse that, well, you're sending your sample to the isotope division, health physics division, they are handling samples from other labs, maybe there is cross-contamination. So I said, okay, we managed to convince the head of the division, we purchased a dedicated new liquid scintillation spectrometer in May of 1993 and installed it in the chemical engineering division where no other tritium work is being done. It had a much lower background sensitivity was one becquerel. And the technique, all the techniques that Ed mentioned were followed, micro distillation and sampled, all stock solution was set first, checked for initials, etc. So again, we found tritium. These were now repeated and, and, and presented at HCC of four. And you can see many more. So in this case, we had eight out of 17 cells in the tritium. Simple, open, light water cells with a variety of uh, uh, cathode uh, materials, but all nickel and electrolyte, Li2CO3, sometimes we had enriched lithium, and the variety of things, everything is in the HCCF 4 proceedings. Time, study of temporal radiation of tritium, six new settles, uh, cells were set up using separating funnels so that samples could be drawn from the bottom without disturbing the cell. We had flat port cathodes, flat plate cathodes, parading wire, now this was from the ICCF 3 paper, I think, Nagoya, OM3, continuous production uh, <coughs> of tritium. Uh, there you are. You can see the, the, this is what we presented in, in Nagoya. But this cell continued operating and we continued measuring. Now, this is what Jed Roth was presented. But this time, the, the, the tritium started coming down and fluctuating. So, over 70 days of operation, this particular cell continued to produce and scavenge tritium. We don't know the mechanism, but uh, I, I think I agree with Ed on that <coughs> it be the nuclear process taking it away. And I was happy to note that uh, Bockers have also seen that. So this is, confirms that. Okay. Self-heated nickel wire experiments. <coughs> Should I stop? A couple of minutes. Okay. Well, let me see. You. i just say a few of this and give up. <laughs> well, this was reported in, in ICCF 5. Just to think to like the ceramic <coughs> wire, self-heated in a hydrogen gas atmosphere, I'll skip all that. But the important point is <coughs> everything was quantified, or you can show the, the heating and you know you can see the hydrogen go up and you know many cycles of heating and cooling and so that the total amount of uh, hydrogen absorbed in the nickel wire is measured, <coughs> increases. This is the total quantum that is measured and I'll exit the result. The important point is 
When we took out such uh, wires, cut it into pieces, dissolved it in the solution, measured the tritium content, there was, of course, tritium, but it was variation, not, not all the sample. In other words, the tritium production in this wire was non uniform. By now, we have learned, you know, the CNA, there are only some spots it happens. Now, let me just come down to the end. I think this is the summary. We'll skip all that. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I think in the, in the light of remark, maybe, but Bokris and I had this friendly dispute as to who reported tritium first in the year. Now, you'll be surprised. Six weeks ago, before his passing away, I have a letter from him. Again, you know, reviving his old subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh no, but you might have seen him, but your paper was produced, published in, in the Karlsruhe people, but that is not a refereed journal. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. I appreciate his listening. We first reported tritium in the nickel hydrogen, as I said, Nagoya. I wonder, I would like somebody to correct me on this. I wonder if our was the first report of a nuclear signature in a nickel hydrogen system. If anybody has any paper indication, if somebody else has reported it, I'll be happy to know. For now, I think we were perhaps the first. Today, in summary, we have reported finding tritium in 25 out of 52 <coughs> nickel hydrogen cells with a 50% success. Promoter now has stopped there, was kind enough to tell me at the Nagoya meeting here, he had a refer to a plasma fo focus experiment, he was kind enough to say, you know, your plasma focus is what triggered my interest in gas discharge. I'll stop here, thank you very much.